privilege to come into God's presence Just to linger with the one who set me free As I lift my eyes and see his awesome glory I remember who he is and bow the knee
Good morning. We're excited to have you joining us for the service of Walnut Creek Baptist Church. And we're still meeting even though, of course, you're all at home and we're here and trying to worship the Lord together. Let's all stand together. And if you're at home, you can stand and sing. We'll be standing and singing here. And we're going to join in singing, How Great Thou Art. We'll sing through two verses. Church, we're glad to have all of you watching this morning. This is a special day. It's Palm Sunday, and we'll also be taking the elements of the Lord's table in just a moment after we take the offering. And then I want you to start to get ready for that as we have uh, informed most of you about that happening, happening today. And uh, we are looking forward to ministering to you and your families today and I ask that God totally bless every one of us this morning. And uh, we have a lot going on in our church, we'll share later on, but I want you to um, be faithful in the area of giving. We have been uh, receiving most of our giving online. We've had some mailed in as well, and thank you, thank you, thank you for supporting our church during this time. God is so good. We want to thank all of those who have been helping out in the community, those who have been helping uh, put this service on and all our Zoom meetings and Sunday school meetings. And we're just excited about what God is going to do after this is over and how he will be glorified and used in our community. Let's pray together. We'll pray for the offering. And then after that, we'll partake of the elements of the Lord's table. Let's pray for the offering. Can we do that right now? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you give us to return to you a portion of that which you have given us. And Lord, I ask that you would... Uh, uh, guide and direct in this service this morning, and that, Lord, you would be glorified in everything that is done. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. My Jesus Christ was torn by me.
appreciate that, uh, those of the music team and putting together all our music this week. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to look at verses 22, 23 to 28. As we partake of the elements of the Lord's table, as we will learn here in just a moment, it is a memorial offering. It is to be done in remembrance of Jesus Christ. By a memorial offering, that means we look back in the past at what Christ did on Calvary and his resurrection, and that's a memorial. Memorials are at the center of most, uh, many of the small towns in Pennsylvania and throughout the East Coast, and a memorial is usually put in the center of a town so you can reflect back on something great that, that indiv an individual has done or that community has done. And what we are Christians are commanded to do through the two ordinances of the church there are only two, baptism and the Lord's Supper, or communion, is we, as a church, corporately come together to uh, partake of the elements of the Lord's table as a memorial offering to remember what Christ did on Calvary and what he did, obviously, the resurrection, which we'll celebrate next week. And this offering, or excuse me, this ordinance is for Christians, those who have accepted Christ as their Savior, and have come to know Jesus Christ uh, through salvation by faith and faith alone. There's no saving merit in partaking of these elements. It's strictly a memorial offering. And I would encourage you, if you're watching today, you know Christ is your Savior, that you can freely partake of the elements of the Lord's table. But let's look what the Bible says. I'm going to read a few verses. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 23. And Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he somewhat was chastising them on the uh, slothfulness and the way they were partaking of the elements of the Lord's table. He says in verse number 23, as he's quoting, For I have received of the Lord that which also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And then after the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft ye drink it in remembrance of me. Now look at verse number 26, please. For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. That's memorial offering. We're looking back towards Calvary, we're looking back towards the resurrection, but we're also looking forward to his second coming. Verse 27, Wherefore, whosoever eat of this bread and drink of the cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And that unworthily, we believe, means that this is an offering to be given to those who know Christ. Know Christ is their Savior. Now look at verse 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of the cup. The first examination should be, do you know Christ as your Savior? The second would be, if you do know Christ as your Savior, and you're partaking of the elements of the Lord's table, there should be some self-examination. Maybe there's unconfessed sin that we can confess in just a few moments as we pray. But I want all of you to examine yourself. Number one, do you know Christ as your Savior? If you had a point or a time in your life when you received him. And number two, if you do know Christ as your Savior, is there any unconfessed sin that you need to make it right with God right now? This is a wonderful time to do that as we partake of the elements of the Lord's table. I'm going to pray right now, and then we will have a time of reflection. After that time of reflection, then what I will do is we'll partake of the bread. So right now, we're just going to I'm going to pray and then let's reflect just for a moment as our music team sings one verse. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I do pray for the bread, the bread which represents the body of Jesus Christ. I thank you for this opportunity that we come, that we have rather, to reflect on what you did on Calvary. Lord, let us examine ourselves. Let us examine our life. And if there be any unconfessed sin right now, let's confess it to you, and we'll thank you for it. In Christ's name I pray, amen.
we find in, so let's, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 24, as we take of the elements of the Lord's, of the, of the bread. The Word of God says, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Now we're going to partake of the elements, the cup, and let me read a scripture verse to you, and I'll say that at the end, but let me just say something about the cup. The cup represents the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The cup is um, his blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And uh, we see that in the word of God. Let's pray for the cup. Can we get it together? Heavenly Father, we pray for the blood. This cup represents the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice that was given, the Lamb of God. And Lord, help us to remember what you did on Calvary. Help us to remember the sacrifice that was given, the ultimate sacrifice of God's only begotten Son. Thank you for conviction of sin. Thank you for allowing us to understand that we accept you as Savior because you paid the perfect price on the cross. The shedding of your blood, which represents, which is represented here by the cup. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Our music team is going to sing right now. And while they sing, let's again, let's pray for the blood of Jesus Christ, which is represented by the cup. text we read earlier, it says in verse number 25, after the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this memorial offering. We thank you for this time that you gave us as a body of believers, even though we're doing this digitally. Lord, the church is not confined to a building. And Lord, thank you for us as a body of believers taking this memorial offering of the Lord's table to understand what you did for us on Calvary and what your sacrifice means. And as we look forward, we look forward to your return, your second coming, and thank you for the stillness that you've given us over the last several weeks to reflect on you. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity you've given us to confess sins as well. And it's in Christ's name I pray, amen and amen. Let's join together in singing our final hymn this morning, The Power of the Cross.
Now we're going to have our scripture reading. If you have your Bibles and you'd like to look with me in the Gospel of Luke in the 19th chapter, Luke chapter 19, and we'll be reading verses 28 through 40. Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. The Word of God says, And when he had thus spoken, he went before, ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him, and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way, and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word this morning. And in just a moment, our pastor is coming with this morning's message. Well, good morning. We come to Palm Sunday, a Sunday that we celebrate every year, right the Sunday before Easter, the Sunday in which is Jesus Christ last week as he goes into Jerusalem. And as he comes into Jerusalem, what we call the triumphant entry, coming from the Mount of Olives on a colt into Jerusalem. I think in my life and in yours, this will be a Palm Sunday we'll never forget as we met digitally through uh, various means of uh, technology to meet this morning. And one of the areas that before I get into the text, and we're going to really apply this to me and you today, as we look at this text, as we understand what was going on, there was a preparation that had been made for three and a half years. There was a time a perfect timing for Jesus Christ no longer to tell those who saw his miracles, go tell no one. Now, he says, we're going to tell everyone. And right now, this time of preparation has come, and it's the perfect time for Jesus to reveal himself. I've titled this message this morning, excuse me, The People Are ready. The people are ready. Let's look if we can at verse number 37, and we'll read this together. I have it on your screen. It says in 19, chapter 19, verse number 37, and when he was come nigh, that means Jesus Christ, close, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, that would be the Mount of Olives is just to the east of Jerusalem. There is the eastern gate in which he will enter into. And he is put on a donkey to come into that gate. And look what the people said. The people that God had been working on. The people that had been prepared. 
for the receiving of Jesus Christ. And it says in that verse, the whole multitude of the disciples. Now that just isn't the twelve. That is all of the followers. Begin to rejoice and to praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. So we're looking this morning at the preparation and the preparing of the people. Let's pray together for this message. Can we do that? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for hearts that are prepared. We thank you for those that are listening right now on various digital means, whether it be a flat screen TV, an iPad, a computer, or a phone. And Lord, you have prepared us for this day. You have prepared us to understand who the Messiah is. That means the Anointed One. Who Jesus Christ is. Many of us are anxious. Some are scared. Many are asking questions. That all goes in to the preparation. Lord, I pray that you would use this message to speak to that person that does not know you as Savior. And for those that do, let this preparation allow us to see your hand upon everything that has taken place. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. As we have been having these services here, this is the fourth week. We just don't show up on a Sunday morning with a handful of us, and we are practicing social distancing. Maybe we got a little closer than six feet, and uh, maybe we shouldn't have done that, but we're doing our best. But every week we get together, we just don't show up on Sunday morning. There's a lot of preparation that takes place. Songs have to be chosen. The music team has to be picked. The practicing needs to take place, whether digitally or in person. A message that I have looked at needs to be prepared and looked at and studied. We have uh, the, the, all of the um, digital folks that are working in the sound room and the internet from Facebook to YouTube have put this together trying to balance out sound and voices and a lot of preparation went into this service this morning at 9.30 and then at 11. There's a lot of preparation going on. We just didn't show up to do our best. And I say that as we look at this text. There had been three and a half years of preparing the people for the receipt and of the Messiah on this day. And that's what we're going to discuss this morning on Palm Sunday. The entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem declared himself unequivocally during this week, he is the Son of God. And ladies and gentlemen, there's been preparation taking place in your homes as well. And I have no doubt, there's no doubt in my mind that are people that are watching right now that God is doing something in your life. He's preparing you for this message. He's re preparing you to do something for God. Many, it's accepting Him as Savior. And we'll talk about that later on. Confessing your sins and crying unto Jesus Christ to save your soul. And for others, as a preparing that has taken place, you have had to sit still with your family. You've had to be confined to a home. And during all this confinement, there's a time that God is working on your life. And that's what we're seeing here. It says in verse number 37, And when he came nigh, or he came close, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they've seen. A preparing for his arrival. Several years ago, when President Bush was running for office in 2004 for re-election. He made a stop into Erie, Pennsylvania. And we knew people that were a part of the airport at the time. There was a lot of preparation that had to take place. There were uh, armored cars that had to block entrances. There were certain restrictions in airspace, even over our church. 
And there was a lot of preparation that took place. And ladies and gentlemen, God is preparing, has prepared for all of us for this time. See, as he went, it says they spread their clothes in the way in verse number six, 36. And they were, they were excited about the Messiah had been identified. This group that were represented here, that is represented here, they were depressed, they were persecuted, they were down, they were looking for hope just like some of us this morning. See, they had had the religion of the day. We look at Matthew chapter 23, the first verse, Jesus said them, He spoke to the multitude and to His disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whosoever they bid you to observe, they observe, and that they observe and do, but do not after their works, for they say and do not. In other words, they had had their share of religion and hypocrisy. Some of us have been in a religious system of the do's and the don'ts, and, and that is not what Christ wants. And see, this group had had that. Matthew chapter 23, which it describes the religion of the day in Jerusalem, it says that there, he had a caustic criticism of the religious order of the day. See, Jesus had healed the sick and the lame, and they all knew about it in preparation. Jesus had turned the hypocritical Pharisees on their head, and they knew that Jesus had said that. The Sermon on the Mount was the opposite of the actions and teachings of the religion of that day. He was no respecter of, of people, whether you were rich or poor. He calmed the storm. He fed the thousands with a bagged lunch. He had caused a stir. And you know the gospel records many times he would say, please do not tell anybody what I did because my time had not yet come. But on this day, right now, it's over. His time has come. Just like it is for me and you, a preparing now is time, as one writer put this, for the marked man to enter in. He would come down from the east side of Jerusalem riding on a colt or a donkey. This grand entrance would identify him as the Messiah. No doubt this was a defining moment and a blast that would be heard around the world. Tensions were growing Expectations were being raised up by the common folk. The Messiah, the man, the Lord Jesus Christ was entering in. Now, if you're a Bible scholar, you understand that he came in on a donkey, not a horse. A horse, a white horse would be ridden by a conqueror. A donkey or a colt would be ridden by someone that brings peace. Christ did not come in to conquer the governmental system of the day, he came to bring peace to mankind through salvation and forgiveness of sins. And there were so many people there for the, at this time, there were so many people there because of the great feast. What a time to introduce the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Passover was one of three feasts that the Jews were supposed to attend in Jerusalem. And consequently, the, the population of Jerusalem had, sw had, had swollen to three to ten times its normal population. This crowd was beginning to gather around Israel. And the larger world of diaspora would know about Jesus, about Jesus and this would spread around the world. All of this was perfect timing, just like it's perfect timing. Everybody look up at the screen for you. And for me. We see that. His message was one of forgiveness, not of conquering. His healing and his miracles was one to point to his deity, not to free them from Roman bondage. And just like many of us in this time of quarantine, in this time of social distancing, we look at that as when will this be over? When can I go back to the way it used to be? The way we should look at it is when am I going to be free from the sin that so easily besets me? 
When am I going to be free and understand who God is and who Jesus Christ is? See, America doesn't need a revival, needs a revival, not an economic revolution. What this needy group of desperate people, children and families, was looking for was hope. And I want to tell you, we find hope in this message today. Today, there's a needy group that awaits. We see preparing. Let me look at verse number 28. And we'll read it through. Verse number 28. And when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending Jerusalem. Verse number 29. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in which you in the which at your entering you shall find a colt tied, whereon never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither, or to me. And if any man ask you, why loose him? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord hath need of him. And then they were sent, went their way, and they found even as he said. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners, said, the owners thereof said unto him, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord have need of him. So there was a preparing of the people even to the detail of the colt that he would ride on. The owners of that colt were already prepared to let him go. Jesus came near to the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. When he drew near to Bethany, he sent two of his disciples into a village to get a colt. And God had already gone there and prepared for them to show up. He told them exactly where they would find the animal and the owners what they would say. After the disciples explained their mission, the owners seemed to be quite willing to release the colt for the use by Jesus. Perhaps they had heard of Christ. We do not know. Maybe they had been blessed by Christ and he had offered his assistance in some type of a healing ministry previously. But Matthew explains that this act fulfilled a prophecy we find in Zechariah, which spoke to the nation concerning the king coming of her king. In a Gentile manner, the Messiah would come in somewhat of a Gentile manner, riding on a colt or a foal or a donkey. This was not the normal way a king would arrive, according to prophecy in Zechariah chapter 9. For they, they usually came riding on horses. A colt was a symbol of peace. Bringing peace to the nation of Israel. Peace to mankind. And Jesus Christ is not come to take away all of our economic woes to bring us peace with God. Zechariah 9.9 says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, and shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, Behold, the king cometh unto thee. He is just having salvation. He shall be lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt of a foal of an ass. So we hear the, the preparing of the people for Jesus to come into Jerusalem, into the eastern gate. People were ready. It's often been said, God is not early, God is not late, He's just on time. And He's just on time. I think in my own life, how God has prepared me. I remember years ago when I was at Auburn University, and I would sit outside the Haley Center. If you know the university, it's a, the largest building. It's a 10 story, eight or 10 story large classroom facility, mostly for freshman classes. And there was a wall that everybody sat on. And literally in this wall area, there might be several hundred to a thousand people or more would sit on the wall and just kind of hang out between classes. And I remember as I would sit there with my books and there was a, a man that came, his name was, they called him Brother Jeb. And Brother Jeb sat up there and preached the Bible about repent and get right with God. At the time, most people mocked that. They laughed at it, belittled it. 
and I would say I did as well. But there was something God was doing during that time in my life that would later convict me of accepting Christ as my Savior some six years later. There was a preparing. And I want to ask all of you sitting here this morning, is God doing something in your life? The fact you're even watching this this morning is a miracle that God is allowing you to hear from Him. The preparing. See, there's jobs, there's places, and the God who believe is sovereign and just and knows the beginning from the end has allowed this quarantine to prepare us to meet Him. And we see that taking place here. The people were prepared. Several years ago, I went to preach a Mother's Day message at another church. The pastor was not there. And when I, wa- I drove into the parking lot with my wife, our children were not with us. They were at our home church. And as we drove into the parking lot, I walked into the church, and one of the deacons came up to me and said, are you Fred Ayers, Pastor Fred Ayers? And I said, yes, I am. He said, well, good. Everything is ready. The choir is prepared. The group is here. We're ready to hear from you. We're prepared, and we want to hear from you and hear from God. They had made preparations for the arrival of the guest preacher. And I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, before I go to the next point, God has prepared all of us for this day. All we have to do is recognize it and understand it. It doesn't mean if you don't, it doesn't mean it hasn't happened if you don't believe it. It is happening right now. The next thing we see is the praising. I want you to look at verse 35, please. The praising. See, as he comes into Jerusalem, they start praising him. Now, no doubt, many of those praising him would be the ones that just wanted the miracles, the free food, and the stuff. But not all of them. Not all of them. And it said in verse 35, and they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they said, Jesus, they're on. So Jesus sat on a colt that's never been ridden. He comes into the eastern gate of Jerusalem, which we had opportunity to see when we were in Israel several years ago, which has been sealed up since the Ottoman Empire, by the way. And as, as they went, they spread their clothes on the way, a way of showing homage, a way of showing respect, a, a way of declaring who he is. And verse 37, which I read a minute ago, when he was come nigh, even now, at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples. Now, again, don't confuse that word disciples with just the twelve. The disciples are followers. A disciple is someone who follows Christ. Now, we had the twelve disciples. There are many called those the apostles. It said the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice. For all the mighty works they had seen. The preparation had brought them to the point of praising Jesus Christ. And look what they said. Interesting. Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So we see here the praising. The disciples made a cushion or a saddle for the Lord with their own clothes. Many spread their clothes on the road before him as he ascended from the western base of the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem. With one accord, the followers of Jesus burst out with praise for all the mighty works they'd seen him do. They were hailing him as the king and chanted the effect that his coming would bring peace and glory in the highest. Now many would think he should have found a horse to ride on, made which symboled some use of power. But his actions there undercut the nationalism that some were trying to point to. And it went into a different direction, evoking image from the prophets which we had just read from Zechariah 9.9. O daughter of Zion, see your king coming seated on a donkey or colt. 
See, Jesus' purpose in riding into Jerusalem was to make public his claim of the Messiah. There was no more hiding. In fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy, and just in a few short days, he would hang and bleed and die on the cross. The streets of Jerusalem, this royal city, are open to him. Like a king, the preparation was there. He receives the worship and praise of the people because only he deserves it. No longer is he telling his disciples to be quiet about him, but to shout and praise and worship him openly. And that's the way we should be doing today. Praising God, worshiping him, worshiping him openly. The spread of the cloaks was an act of homage for royalty. As we find in 2 Kings chapter 9, a reference there. Jesus was declaring to the people he was their king and the Messiah. This is who they had been waiting for. And maybe, everybody look here, I don't know what's going on with this virus. I am not about to follow the ever-changing news, especially all of the different theories about what we should do and what we should not do. But I do know this that now is the time that the preparation has taken place to praise God for His sovereignty, His grace, and His mercy, and now is the time to praise Him. Look, folks, this group was looking for hope. And when they found what appeared to be the answer, they laid their garments and their palm leaves down publicly to praise Jesus. What are we doing, Christian, look here? to publicly proclaim Jesus during this time. I don't know when the quarantine, if that's what we call it, is going to end. I have no idea, and I'm not about to guess. We know for our church, it'll at least be three more Sundays after today, four including today, maybe longer before we meet. The doomsdayers are all out saying it's going to be the end of the year, and the summer saying it's going to be in two weeks. But I do know this. That's not up to me. That's up to God. But I will praise Him in spite of how long it takes. I went out Friday. It was a little discouraged. Believe it or not, preachers get discouraged too. I set my cell phone in the house, left my iPad, wrote a note to my wife. She was gone. And I said, I'm gone. I'll be back. I went down to Prisque Isle. I went to the first parking lot. I pulled into that parking lot and looked at the beautiful water. I saw the city of Erie in the background. You can help but think. I reflected on God, who God is, and it helped me have hope and praise. We need to praise Him and praise God for that. See, when Americans were liberated from the Germans, when the Americans liberated France, from the Germans in World War II as they marched through Paris. You can see, I believe it was Douglas MacArthur, the American general, was on one side. We had the Russians coming from the other side. And the people of France praised the Americans. They were out waving American flags, thanking the Americans for freeing France from the bondage and the tyranny of Nazi Germany. Now, if they can do that, why can't we praise God for the freedom He gives us to have our sins forgiven and to know that in spite of everything going on, this is not my resting place. See, they were excited. They were praising God. The people had been prepared. The people were ready. Several years ago, we met a man that was infected with the AIDS virus. He had lived a lifestyle that brought that virus into his life. And as he was dying a slow death, he was witnessed to by somebody in our church and accepted Christ. And his eyes were as big as saucers after that. He was so excited that God had given him forgiveness, and God had changed his life. And I remember sitting in a restaurant with him one time with another preacher, and we could, he could hear somebody in the booth behind us, and 
somehow he heard something about God or Jesus. I'm not sure what it was, but it was something quote-unquote religious. And this man who was dying of age, who had received Christ, who we were having dinner with, or people was breakfast with, got out of the booth, walked over to total strangers, and told him what Christ had done in his life. Because you know what? He was praising God. He didn't care about decorum. He didn't care about embarrassment. He knew what Christ had done. And he was willing to tell others what Christ had done in his life. Thirdly, as we wind down, let's look at the protesting. And I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, when God starts to work in your life and you start to praise God, there are going to be those who don't like it. There can be those that will say, you know, you got too much of this church stuff in your life. I've heard that before. Look what it says in verse 39. It's interesting that it's the religious people that are protesting. See, the average, if you want to call it peasant, the average person in Jerusalem was excited to hear about the Messiah. But look at the religious people, those leaders of the day. Verse 39, and some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. Tell them to be quiet. They're calling you the Messiah. They are protesting this. You're taken away from our authority. You're taken away from our religion. Look, Christianity isn't about a religious system. It's not about decrees. It's about a relationship. The Pharisees were indignant that Jesus should publicly be honored this way. They suggested that he should rebuke his disciples. The critics were there to pounce on top of him. And let me tell you this, when you come to the point in your life, maybe it's today, that you acknowledge Christ in your life, there will be those that may protest. Jesus answered, though, look at that last verse, it's kind of interesting, with a statement. And he says there, and he answered and said unto them, If I tell you if these should hold their peace, in other words, the disciples, if they if they're not gonna, if they're not gonna praise me, he says there, now look at this, this is interesting. The stones would immediately cry out. You know what he's saying? These inanimate objects called stones would. If the disciples won't do it, the stones will. He rebuked the Pharisees being more for being more hard and unresponsive than stones. Jesus responded, there must be a proclamation that he is the Messiah. If not, even inanimate objects would be called to testify for him. God doesn't need me or you, but he wants us, and he loves us, and he cares for us. See, the people praising offended some because he was offering hope a religious system did not. The glory of God cannot be hidden or silenced. And it won't be hidden through a quarantine. It won't be hidden through a war. And if we don't praise him, the rocks will cry out. Let someone change. Let someone get saved, and let the protesting begin. See, I want to share something with you. The people were prepared. The people were praising, but there were some who were protesting. I want to tell you, which group are you in? I'm going to close here as we wrap this up. A wonderful day of the Lord's table. And I'm going to ask all of us to pray. And there's some here this morning. If we can bow our heads and close our eyes, that's what we do here. I'm going to ask you to evaluate where you stand. Are you the group that will, God has been preparing? You thought you would never in a million years be watching a church service during a quarantine. There's so many other things to do, but God is working in your life. See, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. That's mean the payment, wages is what we get. What we earn for sin is death and separation from God in a place forever called hell. 
But God loves us. The Bible says, but God commended his love toward us. While yet we were sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible also says, as I said a minute, the whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be forgiven. I want to close with this. You don't have to know all the details and all the doctrines of the Bible, but I want to say if God is preparing you, today is the day of salvation. And for those that are saved, maybe God is speaking to you the great things he wants you to do during this time. Let's pray together, can we? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for those here. With all those watching this morning, maybe we can silently pray this, and this will affect many. A prayer doesn't save anybody. Conviction of sin and calling unto God does, and that can be done through a prayer. But maybe you just need to quietly confess your sins right now. And maybe a prayer like this would be applicable applicable to you. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. Are you praying? And if I died right now, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. But I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart and into my life to save me the best that I know how. And I'll live for you forever. The piano is going to play for a minute. And why don't we just reflect on Jesus Christ and what God is doing. And then I'll close. Let's close in prayer if we can. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the service today. We thank you for the Lord's table. I thank you for those who've watched and listened. And I pray that we, as people, are prepared and we're praising about what you're doing in our lives. Let us be a changed people, not just a redeemed people, as we come into the Easter week. Some call it the Holy Week. Lord, help us to be a great testimony and reflection for all those around there. In Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for joining us this morning. We'll have our seed groups tonight at 5 o'clock, and our teens are meeting at 5 o'clock on Zoom as well. And uh, we'll get more information later to our church folks. There is one other thing we're going to be doing, and one of them is we're going to be having um, a group, and we're going we're to be getting other groups together, and it's going to be called our quarantine groups, in which you can get together with people in our church and talk and just have fellowship together. If you're interested in that, we'll be sending an email out and we're going to put in different groups just a chance to talk to each other. You'll be able to use our Zoom account, the church Zoom account, so you can talk to your friends in our church family or even outside of the church as well. God bless you. Take care. And we look for you to join in at five o'clock if you can for our Zoom Sunday school class on the answers in Genesis and the teens will be meeting as well. Thank you.